contains uh, it contains a great big ton of as we used to call it down here. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say the summer school never starts right and the laws of money be proven on board. But I'll tell you one thing, there's a big crew of the money. Uh, I have the privilege of knowing Tom Mulligan and all the young Mulligans since, and I've had the privilege of playing music in the old days up in Penny Max Pope, up in the High Street, which was a haven for, for, music to, uh, for traditional musicians. And um, it's gone now, and Lord Bruce Paddy and the wife, they've passed away in the last couple of years. But since that, the town hasn't been the same. But I remember there'd be up to 30 musicians playing together, and I might be the only one of them that's left. A lot of them were uh, passed away in the last 10, 15, 20, 20 years. So I was just asked uh, to, to introduce uh, the Mulligans to you today, and uh, it's one of the easiest jobs I'm going to have this week because I know so much about uh, these guys and uh, their friends, and I had the privilege, as I said, of playing, playing music with Big Tom Mulligan and uh, all the people that, that were alive in those days. So, you know, without further ado, I'm not going to say any more. Uh, I want to just welcome the boys on board, and uh, I want to also just pay tribute to the people who gives us this church. I want to thank George Williams down there. He opens the doors every year to let us this church, and it's very important. So um, I'll leave it at that. So I'm going to hand you over to Amelie, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Okay. <laughs>
think uh, if <coughs> at any stage uh, anyone would like to contribute or pass commentary or anything like that, we can, we can stop the DVD and might play a tune or something like that at some stage. You know? uh, we play a few of the relations are here, we play some tunes at the end, so it won't be all talking and watching, so we'll, we'll have some tunes as well. So that's kind of the plan for, for uh, this. We hope it won't last more than about an hour, an hour and a quarter anyway, so let you back in with the sunshine then. So we're in the and we'll just get out to, to start the, the recording of We've very few uh, actually actual recordings of, of them playing music, but the first one is a recording that happened in 1982, I think it was, a couple of years before we died, and uh, tossed the feathers and um, Gorman Field, and Gorman is called the Piper, that's very good for over here there. Lion Piper, uh, Johnny Gorman, or Jack Piper, as well. Um, a lot of his music influenced a lot of uh, musicians around Northern Connacht, Northeastern Connacht, whatever. So, we just start this here. Tom Mulligan had a unique South Leitrim fiddle playing style which was influenced by his musical father Thomas, fiddle master Jack Comboy and the extensive world of Irish music that he embraced and encountered throughout his life. A man generous in friendship and hearty by nature, he cultivated and nourished a depth of Irish cultural warmth that transposed to all that knew him. Tom was born into a family of four brothers and two sisters in Currycramp, Barnacoola, near Mohull in County Leitrim in 1915. His father Thomas played the fiddle and flute and his grandfather John played the concertina. The following dialogue is part of an interview recorded by Neely Mulligan in 1997 where Neely interviews Tom's brother Colin Mulligan. Your 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 own father. <coughs> Who taught him to sit? Or where did he pick up the fiddle? Oh, well, if, uh, I don't know about the fiddle or the flute or either. Who taught him? But uh, he always played it like uh, from my new yeah. first, you know. Yeah. And he'd come in after a hard day's work, and he had the flute on the dresser, and he'd take down the flute, and he'd dance along with it. That's play and dance. Uh, yeah. yeah. In his early years of growing up, Tom's father had to travel to America to work. So then your father went to America, didn't he, when you were young? Uh, he did. He went in 1926. And uh, Tom, uh, your father was the oldest, like, in the family. And uh, he did all uh, the Jarvian with the Vietnam State Church, Mass, and all that sort of thing. And yeah. I'll never forget, I met the aunt uh, the first time I met her. In America, that's uh, Uncle Pat's wife. Yeah. And he stayed with her in America, you see. Yeah. And she was telling me, oh, one night he was playing somewhere, and there was a big long forum, and he was on the end of the forum. Yeah. And the uh, crowd came in, and they uh, were all crushing onto the forum. And the next thing she says, he landed on the floor, but she says, he never missed a note. <laughs> <laughs> And so Tom attended fiddle lessons with local fiddle master Jack Comboy. Was Jack the man that taught that first day? He was, yes, right? he was. Yeah, yeah. And he so was. Did your father teach him? No, no, no. no. It was all Jack. Uh, my father was in America when he started um, this. Who would have taught Jack Comboy the fiddle? John McGinnis. John McGinnis. Who was the son of the paper Mick McGinnis? Oh. Big, uh, yeah. His uncle John and his aunt Lizzie also played the fiddle and his aunt Catherine played the concertina. Instruments were in short supply in those days and both Tom and his brother Colum improvised by making fiddles from old plywood tea chests 
and whatever materials they could get their hands on. Tom apparently had a great talent for carving the scrolls for fiddles. Uh, then when he was about uh, 12, I was about 9, or what, even 9, he started making fiddles. The two of us got into it. We used to get THS and yeah. the local store, the yeah. plywood, you know. Right. There was no uh, belly or rice on the back or belly, you know. It was just uh, plain flat. Right. And we met, we met, uh, oh, I mean, there was a dozen of them. <laughs> when Daddy was going to America, he gave his fiddle to Willie McGarry. Willie was learning at the time, and he had no fiddle. Willie came over to play for the party, yeah. along with Jack and Boy, and uh, he went to Jack and Boy too yeah. afterwards. And I forget who was playing there that night. I was only uh, uh, the, I was eleven or twelve at the time. You yeah. Say. yeah. But when when the tea went on up on the room, your father swiped the fiddle and took off home. <laughs> Before <laughs> Willie came down, he had no fiddle. Did he realize where it was gone? He did. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> how he got to know how he got to know when he came back down, yeah. you see. When I see now, Molly McKeown, uh, next door, uh, Trust came home from America and she brought home this gramophone with a little, like little suitcase, you know. Yeah. And she'd all call them and records, do you see. Right. And did we give them a spin every Sunday that went on from daylight to dark? Before he emigrated to the United States, his brother Fran was a renowned singer. Colum too later emigrated and developed his skills in the art of fiddle making and repairs in Long Island, New York. Other siblings sang too, like Alfie, Jerry, and Sister Enda, while his older sister Lily learned the fiddle from Frank O'Higgins when she moved to Dublin. After finishing primary school, Tom worked on the farm and for a time on the railway at Trumot, where coal came down the narrow gauge railway from Arigna Mines heading for Dublin. It was in Mughal in 1932 he first heard and fell in love with the sound of the Illum pipes when Leo Rowsom came to play in the town. Rose and one time he was down at a show in Mull in uh, 1932. He had a set of pipes, that was the first set of pipes I saw. And uh, they went through me, I went crazy about them. Tom, being the eldest, eventually headed to Dublin in 1935 to work, initially finding work in a shoe factory, and subsequently he got a job with Irish Life Insurance, where he worked until his retirement. In 1935, he came up to Dublin and I got in. I had an aunt living here, yeah. she was a draper shop. So she fixed me up with a bit of an old job at the time and kept going at it. But from to her, like I, um, I, she introduced me to uh, Felix McCabe, who was um, married to a cousin of ours, and he was a fiddle player. This Felix McCabe brought me down to uh, Tim Mulligan's then, and, and uh, there I met all the mm-hmm. musicians. She was to Kelly there at night, you know. I met the ladies, the Balhaven, the trio from Leeds, from Joe, Tommy, and Ned Garman. And we had, uh, met Bill Hart, Sonny Brogan. From that, like, I, I went from, got to know them. Then we started visiting houses, you know, having a session in this house and that house, you know, around the place. But mostly in Tim's at the time. He met up with Seamus Ennis after arriving in Dublin and within three years had a set of C-sharp pipes, similar in pitch to Ennis's coin set made by James McCrone, a pipe maker from Abbey Shrule in County Longford. It was from Mulcrone that he bought his treasured Oli Bull fiddle. I went on then to, uh, of course, I, went, I met up then with um, Seamus, and it's through this where I got the set of pipes made in Peter's Road here by old Jim McCrone. I used to meet Seamus there, and his father used to go to Mass in Garden Street, and they'd come up after Mass on a Sunday, and... Um, there's where I, I met, uh, they advised me to get this set of pipes and the Macronos after making it. I have it still in the house. The young lad plays it there. I need plays it. He's in. Tommy Reck, with whom he struck up a musical partnership for many years before he got married, provided piping lessons for the young Leitrim lad, who was newly immersed in the world of Illum piping 
and further tackled the art of chanter making at a later stage of life. Musical times in Dublin in the 1930s and the 1940s were confined to House Cayleys and some musical clubs such as Common the Peabry Yellen in Mould's workplace, where Tom became a committee member along with the same Leo Rousam and Tommy Reck. Public performances were limited to fashionists and the Pipers Club's trips to various locations on the outskirts of the city, like Ireland's Eye and Scurries, before the musical pub culture started in Dublin in the 1960s. The emerging flag kills were also a common outlet and various excursions around the country were undertaken to adjudicate competitions and enjoy sessions. Tom married Catherine McMahon from Beale in North County Kerry, who was nursing in Hollis Street Hospital at the time. They went on to have eight children, five boys and three girls. Before now, Church Street was formed at Tom. Just at the beginning of the war, um, uh, Molesworth uh, Place, Schoolhouse Lane was going. We had a little club there, Piper's Club. That was the Piper's Club that went to Thomas Street after. Oh. I was on the committee of that with Tommy Reich and Leo Rousam and Mr. O'Connor at Clunniff Road and um, Ned Gorman and, and oh, who is it? A few more. There had to be any, uh, at least, uh, I think at the time, that would be at least um, uh, two thirds musicians on the committee. We. Uh, uh, Ordered four sets of pipes from, uh, from uh, one from Jim McCrone, one from John Clark, two from Leo Rousam, and um, who the other? There were three makers. Oh, just three makers, yeah. Who are the four sets? And then we sent four young lads to the school of music with those pipes. Leo was teaching. Leo Rousam was teaching in the school of music. You see, mm. so uh, we used to pay for them from the club. The club, you see, uh, then at that time was very b bad in money. We were paying 13 shillings a week and we were only getting tuppence or so each from each member. The money was very scarce. But we ha um, got a, a flag, we wrote to the superintendent, we got a, a flag there for Dublin, you see, and we went out in the streets and Terry Reck and myself played together and Jim Seary and Ed Garman played. Well, we were at Elbury's and they were up at Kingston's and there was a couple more playing. And then there was only about five, four or five collectors with boxes, Maggie Flynn and Peter. They follow us with the boxes. As a matter of fact, there's a photograph uh, someplace over in the Cultura of us. We had, I had a beard, I mean, a hard hat, and Tommy Reck had a moustache and a hard hat as well in him. The way nobody had known us, we were, <laughs> we were afraid. Right. But uh, that uh, day made the, the club, the whole thing be finished only for that day. It was going today, it'd be finished. This is the Piper Club now? Yeah, it was in, in Molesworth, um, off Molesworth seat there in Schoolhouse Lane. That day, we, we got £50 out of it. We were in debt with the rent and all that. The thing would have to close up all together and we'd be all scattered then again. Like that continued in on from that to Thomas Street. And mm -hmm. from Thomas Street, it continued in 1950 to farm in uh, 51, the first flag call in Mullingar was farmed by the committee of Thomas Street. Which, but I was, at that time, I was getting married and I was like more or less uh, out of music scene altogether. But then I used to go up now and again to them. But they, this where they started Celt, it's above on Thomas Street. And I went to the first, first fly in Mullingar and I couldn't find anybody. <laughs> I went, I, I, the only thing I saw, a football match or a hurling match out in the, the grounds in Mullingar and I went out and I sat in, in the corner of the little stage and they were dancing and a couple of fellas playing for them. They were doing step dancing. Yeah. But they were uh, mostly in, um, I've heard Leo was playing upstairs in the hotel in, in uh, Mullingar that day. And I couldn't see anybody. That, I'd say that day, like, saved uh, that flag day. Saved the whole, as far as I, I make out, it saved the whole situation. Like, when was that now? Right there, well, you know, it was during the war. Okay. I'm not sure of the date. I wouldn't know which year it was. But. In the meantime, after the Pipers Club in Molesworth Street became the seed for the eventual formation of Kiltus Kiltoryern in 1951, Tom helped in the establishment of the St. Mary's Music Club, Church Street, in Dublin. Formed with fellow musicians like flute and fiddle players John Egan, John Brennan, Bill Davis and Tony Conlon, all from the North Connacht area in the 1950s. We started a club in Church Street. 
we were in a room first down in Eccles Street and then we moved down and got a room down beside Lavin's pub there and that ran for 20 years and we had great sessions down there. So they were wonderful. Right. Just, we moved into a hall then just at the back of the room and it was nice so we had two and three hundred and there was, there was powerful music that came from all over. Any fellow going, it was a wedding night, you see. Yeah. And fellas going back to England, Willie Clancy and Bobby Casey and all those fellas that were going to be going back to the calling and we'd have a great session in for the night. And that went on for about um, 20 years until Laban sold the pub. And of course we were worried then. We thought we'd, have, we'd better look for some other place. So we went down to the Bruni Gale, the GA club down in Georgia seat. That had been more recent now, and we had um, sessions there also on Wednesday night. We had a room upstairs in the top, room and we had great, great uh, music came there too. All the, uh, by the way, in short you now the Dubliners were only start, we, they came into us at the beginning, and they uh, they got all the stuff there. Barney McKinnon, old Ted Fury, and all those or in church seat I wouldn't be able to remember them all the place was full of them you'd see a, r- a ring of them now in the hall and Alfie's father you know yeah. and Tom Mulligan he was a great man and John Kelly too like uh, and of course John Egan yeah. the tr- I used to, my father used to call them the three musketeers and the three boys had always way in together like I played in church tree club with, with, with Alfie's father you know and I had some great times with old Tom uh, great times with old Tom Mulligan great man you know only came down for the record. Yeah. And he, he, he thought there was about 20 musicians in the session all like around. And there's many more, maybe twice as many more listening, you know. But uh, um, uh, after Church Street, we went up to the Bruny Gale and we st- lasted there until um, something went wrong for the Bruny Gale. They, they went into debt. and But uh, to, uh, John Brennan used to be with us from Fingers, Johnny and Tony Connell and Bill Davis, Larry Mercy and Bill, he's dead now. He's a fiddler from Sligo. Tony was from Costna in Roscommon. And John was from Riverstone. John Egan was from Riverstone in Sligo. Oh, John played pipes. Oh, he played the flute. Mm-hmm. And John Brown played the flute. They were off the old King Cory Cayley band, along with Pack O'Brien, Mrs. Harrington, and poor Mr. O'Connor. He played. It was there that his sons Neely and Jerry started their musical journey under the tin whistle tutelage of Paddy Bonabrin, Mick O'Connor and Ned Stapleton, before eventually turning their hands to learning the pipes, initially from their father and then subsequently attending classes with Leo Rousel. His son Tom, now of the established cobblestone fame, also played along with his brother Alfie, who plays the famed Rousel Felix Doran silver set of pipes while the remaining children, Colum, Gráinne, Maura and Annie, all played instruments too. Tom, along with his son Neely, attended the founding Tinole of Nepibri Illan in Bettystown in 1968. His love for all things Irish, and especially the Irish language, saw him spending his summer months with his family in the Gwaeltocht in Indravon, learning Irish and immersing themselves in the culture of Connemara. Enduring friendships were developed with Chano's singers, Tam Fajin Tam, Sean Donica, and musicians like Festi Conlon, Matty Joe Hamish and many more. On Krushkin Lawn and T. Hughes's in Spiddle, were favourite locations for many great sessions in the 1970s. Leitrim was a major musical attraction for the Mulligan family and for many years they journeyed there for musical weekends in Mohol, Drum Kieran, Drum Shambo, where musicians like P. Fitzpatrick, Joe Lackey Gallagher and flute player Packy Dignan were respective musical magnets. The John McKenna Festival was also attracting the Mulligans and many other musicians to Leitrim. John McKenna came from America in 1938. He was a wonderful flute. They were asked to put the monument up to him down in Leitrim, a tarman outside of the Fiendum Shaman. They were giving me put it up there last uh, 
Mont. You from Nitra, was it? Oh, he was. Great to in America. He died there, and uh, we all subscribed to the local monument to him there recently. Oh, yeah. So the man, the man, it was a great day down there. We had a wonderful day. And, but anyway, it was a night. The night he arrived in 1938, the ladies and the whole lot arranged for him to. And we all went down to Clontarf to Tommy's digs. Tommy was a tram driver here in Dublin at the time. He just drove the tram from the pillar out to Dothney. <coughs> and uh, that night I met up, I met more musicians. God, they came from every place. Frankie Higgins there, uh, Mrs. Harrington, Mrs. Rowland, Mrs. Sheridan, John Hart, John Gardner. They were all brothers and sisters. Um, the Sonny Brogan, Bill Hart, were all there anyway at the night. It was a wonderful night in it. Tom was a good friend of Willie Clancy and made many musical visits to him in Milltown Malby. And after Willie's passing, attended the Willie Clancy Summer School in its early years. It was there that he formulated the idea that Drumshambo could host a similar summer school and suggested this idea to Paddy and Betty McManus. Tom, unfortunately, did not live to see his idea come to full fruition in the establishment of the Joe Mooney Summer School, which has been running since 1989. Tom died suddenly in 1984, two days after playing at the funeral of his friend, Joseph O'Haney, and is buried beside his wife Catherine in Barnacoola in County Leitrim. Tom Mulligan's legacy has now spread through his family and children to the upcoming generation of many grandchildren and beyond, now playing and carrying on this great musical heritage. Neely the Piper, and he has a family now of four, and they all play music, you know. He's a son, Faker, a piper, and a fiddle player, and a, and a daughter, Quiva. She's a lovely, lovely fiddle player now. And the other two coming up, Ushin and uh, Ava, are both playing the fiddle, you know. You have Alfie, who's living in Dundalk, and he has three kids. He's Saiv, a, a grand flute player, and Tyg, a fiddle player, and Sarah, a concertina player. My brother Colm has three as well. There's Siobhan, plays the fiddle, and Neve, the whistle player, and Parik is piper. And there's my own. Um, with Tomas, who was a singer and guitar player, and he used to play the accordion, but he's that's gone by the wayside at the moment. And then of Shiva, who's a grand fiddler, and then Maeve here, who's a concertina player and a fiddle player, she's a grand, grand, grand musician now. So that'll be the majority. I have a sister, Grania, who has a couple of kids that are playing, but they're not at the broadcasting stage yet. And uh, like the tradition is strong there, and it nearly goes from strength to strength. And, I have a brother Jerry, he's based in Boston, he's a piper as well. He is one of the unsung heroes of Irish musical life over many decades in the Dublin music scene. A man who carried his musical legacy with passion, pride and humility and who embraced, cherished and influenced Irish music and culture in the most loving way. He veg a lehead a rishan. Ak Maran a quit kyol a mask clani wailagan, agus nadini illig ganyakishay evaim orho. Now, folks, we're here on the 19th of March 2013 in the Cobblestone Bar in Smithfield. My name is Tom Mulligan. I want to introduce you to my family. You can figure out who they are when you're <laughs> throw to peace here. Uh, we're all uh, uh, descendants of Tom Mulligan from Barnacool and Leitrim who left us this legacy and we want to play a few tunes. We want to play a selection of jigs here, uh, the Lilton Banshee, the Kilavel jig and the Kesh for starters anyway. Okay. <laughs> Times round, right? Say it.
had any regrets. He enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, but 
it, and even say the likes of uh, Gary Perry walking from uh, down from, from the Shannon right up, essentially up to North Clare. Uh, you just did it. You, you, don't, you didn't think of it, you wanted to do something, oh, we'll go and see a man. So you just went walking, it took two hours. So what? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I find that hard to, to, to get Tuesday, you know, yeah, and then go back home and then that uh, yeah. But reminded me of doing a kind of mild research, uh, thinking, in fact, it had to do with uh, Johnny, thinking of the distance from Drogson Station. Mm. Uh, but uh, I thought, you know, he has to get closer, if that's inside the boat, mm. and he has to get closer for, for this story to happen. But then I started thinking, I live in Fredericksburg near the Rothstone, and I used to, at six years of age, I always used to walk down as far as the keys. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a step, yeah. But uh, we used to walk out for a picnic out beyond Finless. That's five miles. You just didn't think about it. There's so in actual fact, it's a different way of looking at distances than you have today. You have it to yourself. Yeah. <laughs> when Seamus Hansen come off the train at Broadstone and all sits in the station there, my father was taking things in uh, most places, wasn't it? it? just go lift the, the window and jump into the bed, my father. It's the same thing as I found out to, to finish, you know. Yeah. Wake up in the morning with Seamus Hansen so <laughs> I, I discovered it later. I actually live up the other end of the lane from Bill Hart. Yes. Yeah, yes. There's yeah. a place. Bill was an accordion player. Yeah. yeah. Manor Hamilton, I think. Yeah. He was a good old, great uh, man for the trust trees. Uh, uh, Sonny Grover and I didn't meet, him, but Bill and I did, did meet in my younger days when I started off. So my sister was in the class uh, yesterday teaching uh, a great grandchild of Leo Rosens who taught me the pipes who my father saw the first day here. And I know Kevin is here. So it's amazing how the, the circle comes. And then Mick O'Connor taught me the tin whistle in, in uh, Church Street. And his son is teaching my kids fiddle. You know? And my daughter is teaching his uh, niece and nephew's shallow stacks. So it's, the whole family thing is very, uh, very connected all together. You know? It's amazing when you kind of reflect on how it is. You know, there's, uh, does anybody else want to come out or ask anything or say anything? I, yeah, a small little tribute. Sure. Yeah. Um, Just stand up after this. Yeah. I didn't. Uh, I don't have much information about Tom. I bumped into him in the Fiddler's Club. He was part of the group that was playing there. I didn't know Jake from a raid, Mayor Culpa, uh, when I went in. But uh, as I said, he obviously was very tolerant because uh, as, it, as I wrote, in more recent times, I went around terrorising musicians with this monster barrel on for a few years before I took up uh, learning the pipes. But uh, my <coughs> piping development owes a tremendous amount to Tommy Mulligan, and that is down to his loyalty to his friend Seamus Ellis. Seamus was a little over fond of the, the drink, shall we say. And uh, he was taken under, um, oh, I can't remember to say, uh, Brown, Ivor Brown, Ivor Brown's wing. And he was residing in, uh, in Greg's Gorman. And during that period there, Tommy picked him up uh, every week and brought him over to a pub at the back of the Glass Lake and Cemetery, the, uh, the Royal Oak. And the second Brian Gallagher went down. And we were able to stand and watch him, you know, this distance away and ask him questions. And then, of course, the, there'd be a bit, a little bit more music, but mainly it was Seamus himself playing. And that, the information I picked up from, from there led on to me being able to teach other people how to play, to improving my piping, uh, and uh, hopefully doing a little bit of good for the whole piping world. Uh, and without, Tommy bringing uh, Seamus over like that, I think my life uh, would have been uh, not as good. My musical life would definitely not have been as good and would not have been able to pass it on to other people.
finish up with uh, a couple of real uh, selection that my dad used to play, the fair amount of lasses, the lovely lasses and the rows in the garden. So uh, I just want to really thank you all for coming along, especially people that <coughs> travelled so far and friends, relatives, musicians, people that know them and uh, people that know the family as well. So I just want to say you've got a real long good career, so talk for this. Uh, we'll be around the town when you retire somewhere after this and maybe have a tune or something. So. Or meet them all good. So we'll finish with the, this selection of 